I've gotten a lot out of this last preaching series on hashtag winning. I hope you have too. We've, today we'll be the, concluding that. Beginning next Sunday, we'll begin our summer, uh, summer series. A lot of times, most of the time this summer, we're gonna, we take a book and we go, go through it, kind of uh, start to finish in a sense. And um, this summer, we're going to do Jesus according to Matthew, King of Kings. And so we'll start that, we'll start that series next week. The, the messages in this hashtag winning series have been Pastor Chris Clayton um, preached a message called Winning at Worship, and then I followed with one called Winning at Marriage. Pastor Jen did Winning at Parenting, and then I did last week Winning at Work, and I would encourage you, if you missed any of those, you can catch them on, on the website or the podcast. Um, the Winning at Work one was one of my favorites. Um, I'll go back and listen to it. As hard as it is to go back and listen to myself, but it's a, it's a, it's 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 a unique thing to look at a third of your life, and if you don't look at it as worship, how it, and when you do, how it kind of changes how you go about your work, and that was that was last week. Um, I think that these these four areas, the one I'll do this week, represent some of the most significant relationships that we have in life: our relationships at work, uh, our spouses, our kids with God. Um, but too much of our lives. End up gets up lived in a reactive kind of mode. We react to circumstances. We react to things instead of being proactive, kind of having a plan uh, to go at certain things. Uh, survival skills are great. Um, I love my ability to problem solve. It's one of the things that I think I, one of the things I do the best maybe under pressure is um, figure out how to get past where, where we are. But having a proactive plan, is, it's actually better on the heart. A proactive plan engages God the Father, it engages His Word, it employs His wisdom and His power. In fact, last week I introduced you that God has created us to co-create with Him. And so we co-create our life plan with Him. We co-create a plan and a direction and a path. And when we do that, then what we find is that He, that he then co-powers it for us, with us. Um, one life strategy is just to do everything on our own. And that's a strategy, but that strategy has significant limitations to it, okay? It will only take you as far as you can take yourself, and most people could be fine with that. I want to go further than what I can do myself. The, the other kind of life plan that people use is kind of like take life as it comes. It seems like it's a good plan, um, but I think it's kind of more of a a coping me mechanism because it really then just take life as it comes and just life then drags you anywhere it wants to take you. It's kind of like the old joke of the pilot that after taking off and then getting to cruising altitude came on the intercom and said, I've got good news and bad news. So the bad news is that as shortly after takeoff, we lost all navigational equipment and all communication uh, capabilities. So the good news is we've caught a 100-mile tailwind, and we're making excellent time. We have a tendency too much to treat motion or even motion and speed as if it's taking us to a valuable destination. In life, we, we're going to catch some tailwinds, but we're also going to hit some headwinds. Tailwinds isn't always that we're doing everything right, and he, uh, headwinds isn't we're always doing something wrong. I mean, you're going to hit headwinds in a lot of different circumstances, but we also hit headwinds, maybe even in the people in the environment that's around us. You might have heard the old phrase, misery loves company. But there's another one that I created that call, <laughs> says mediocrity loves company. All right? And so, and so fighting the own culture around us uh, of mediocrity is something. It's a headwind that we have to kind of, we have to tackle and push through. So the fifth um, winning, hashtag winning message today that I consider a significant um, thing that we all want to win with is winning at money. Winning at money. Did you have any money discussions growing up with mom and dad or guardian? Any kind of significant conversations? My, no, my, we owned our own business and my mom was an accountant, but still, even though there were some financial discussions, most of them sound like maybe in your home. Here's kind of how it came up. Do you think money grows on trees? That was, that was part of one of our money discussions at home. Quickly followed by, I ain't made of money. That was another financial discussion. And then there was the, do you think, uh, where would it go? Um, close the door. We don't live in a barn. 
Now, I find it not as applicable in Tennessee as it was in New Jersey. <laughs> some, of, some of you actually might have a really nice barn. Um, but we, we didn't in New Jersey, but that was kind of the extent of our, our conversations. Or you could recognize the tension in a home when there's money things going on. There's tension and maybe the, a celebration of dinner. You know that things are changing. But why, why is talking about money so difficult? Well, really, it's not. So many of our conversations have money in it, but it's just not our money we're talking about. All right? If we can talk about money, let's just don't talk about my money. Right? Because money carries with it a significant set of emotions. Money impacts our sense of identity. Money impacts our sense of security. Money impacts our sense of optimism. Money impacts our sense of success. But if our parents really didn't talk about money very much, and our friends, the conversations are more about money but not my money, why in the world <laughs> would a pastor talk about money in church? Could it be any more awkward? And I say I'm talking about it because it's too important of a subject to ignore. It's too integral to how we live our lives. The second is that I care about you. If I'm going to care about you and not just preach easy, fluffy stuff, I'm going to have to talk about money. Why? Because God cares about you more than I do. And there's over 2,300 verses of Scripture that have some relation to money. 15% of what Jesus taught had some context of money to it. <laughs> one, of my, one of my favorites um, is when it was time to pay the temple tax. And one of his disciples came and said, it's Jesus, I, we need to pay the temple tax. And he said, well, go, go catch a fish and open the fish's mouth and take the money out of the fish's mouth and go pay our taxes. And, and I've, I've tried that multiple times, and that miracle has not reproduced itself through time. But the fact that Jesus was real, lived in the world, and there was taxes and everything else, and, and then Jesus knew how important it was he understand the importance in the kingdom of God that we needed to understand money. So to win at money, we're going to talk about three different elements of money. We're going to talk about the heart of money. We're going to talk about the mechanics of money. And yet we're even going to talk about the power, the power of money. Here's the heart of money. We can begin there in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And skipping to verse 24, he says, No one can serve two masters. If that was um, translated uh, directly, it would say no one can serve two lords. The word for master there is the word for lord. It says either you will hate the one and you would love the other, and love there translated specifically is the, the word agape, which we talk about here. This is an unconditional, self, uh, selfless love. said so you're going to either hate one Lord and selfless, selflessly love this other Lord, or, and you're, or you'll be devoted to this one Lord, and you'll despise the other Lord. You can't serve both God and money. It's such an important topic that Jesus addresses it in his first sermon, first public sermon. Jesus is closing it out, talking about this idea of where is your heart as a location. So, so one way to kind of, to, to, to kind of put it in our vernacular is he says if, if our heart is in heaven, if our, if our heart is for eternal things, then we want, we want our earthly life to be spent on developing things that will outlast us, things that will have eternal value. But there's going to be another pull. And that pull is for us to focus on what's happening right here and now and spend our life and energy about what's right here and now. Now, he's not saying that right here and now isn't important and the things have to be taken care of, but he's talking about where is, where is the location of our heart. Because if our heart's here, then we're going to focus our attention on what's going to be here. And what's going to be here is not nearly as safe. It's going to have a limited impact than what is there. Um, verse 24, he really, really gets into all of our grills when he starts talking about these things, God and money, these are lords. The, the, they're going to have impact. And so one of my favorite quotes around money is mine, actually. And it's, um, money makes for a great tool, but a lousy lord. 
God makes a great Lord, but a lousy tool. I like it better than you do. <laughs> Money's amoral. It, there's, there's no morality attached to money. Money's amoral. It's what we do with it, how we perceive it, how we use it, how we see it. Do we give our hearts to it? You follow me. I'll give you a, a funny example. When I was in my doctoral program in New Jersey back in the early 2000s, I met a Methodist pastor, Jim, and he and I became friends. He pastored a Methodist church in Midland, Texas. And Midland, Texas in the, is in the middle to nowhere, right? But it's Midland, Texas, and he, I, we were talking to one another about how our road to ministry, how that road took place. And he said, well, mine's pretty interesting. I used to sell insurance. And he said, I was really good at selling insurance, uh, really good in my company, but it started losing its allure to me. I started becoming more dissatisfied with selling insurance. And he said, what actually ended up kind of making my break was at a conference that we attended that our company put on, they had Tom Landry come to speak. Now, Tom Landry in Texas, okay, here is this legendary football coach at Dallas Cowboys. So in Texas, there are times where God was number one and Tom Landry was number two. And there were times where Tom Landry was number one and God was number two. And they bring Tom Landry in and Coach Landry gives this amazing speech on, on sales. But it frustrated my buddy because he said, he, he said, Landry knows nothing about selling insurance. I need to get out of this business. He said, so I said, okay, well, then what do I value? I want to put my life to what I value the most. Here's how I'm going to determine what I value the most. He said, I got out my checkbook. And I decided to go through. Now, okay, I, I, gosh, I need to break. Okay, there's, there's these little plastic things. It's called debit cards. But before those, there were checks. And then you can write them to any denomination you wanted. And he said, so he was going back through his checkbook and realized his most consistent, the most consistent place that he gave was his church. And he said, I'm going to be a pastor. <laughs> now, that wasn't my road. I'm not saying that should be everybody's road. But that was Jim's road. He looked to see what do I value. And it's really an amazing principle. What do I value the most? Where is my heart? His checkbook showed him where his heart was. It is about the pull of money. One of the most um, well-known parables that Jesus taught, known inside and outside the church, has this kind of title called the prodigal son. All right? And if you've been around the, the parable, you, you might lean to recognizing the parable of the prodigal son as one around the graciousness of God. But actually, and that's true, I'm not taking away from that, there is a, there is a bigger frame that that gets put in. All right? So this, we'll just call him a farmer. He, he had this ranch or this farm. He, you know, that would have been the main source of, of wealth in those days, how many animals, the land, all that kind of stuff. And he had a young son, firstborn, and he had a secondborn son. The secondborn son, at some point in time, the way Jesus tells the story, okay, it's a parable. That means Jesus used this to, to, to teach principles. This wasn't reading out of the newspaper. Are you with me? He, he's trying to get, make sure everybody can understand what he's trying to say here about money. And he says, now listen, there's this younger son figured that he had had enough of the family farm and business, that he was finished with it and its restrictions and its tightness and all that, and he wanted to go live life the way he wanted to live life. So he goes to his father, and he asks for his share of the, his inheritance right then. Now, especially in that culture, that was treating the dad as if he was dead to him. It was a complete reversal. It was a complete, I don't want to be a part of family. I don't want to be a part of the family business. I want my own stuff. I've earned it. I've sat here. I've worked. Give me my stuff. I want to go live life how I want to live. And what gets kind of lost in this story is the extreme wealth that the father had. How do I know that? Because at no time did, when Jesus is telling the parable, did the dad have to go sell any cattle. He didn't have to sell a piece of property. And what I know about, what little I know about family farms is so much of a family farm's well, so to speak, is tied up in equipment, it's tied up in land, it's tied up in livestock, right? It's not tied up in cash and it's safe in the, on the, in the bedroom, right? And so, but there's no indication of him setting them off with 30 cows and saying, here's your inheritance. He cash flows the kid's inheritance. The young man takes the inheritance, he goes and he does everything that he would have ever wanted to do, what was completely opposite of what his father's life was. 
And then when he runs out of all of that money, he says, well, now i got to get a job. So ironically, not because Jesus is telling the story, he goes to work at a farm. He winds back up at a farm or a ranch, and he does so because he's hungry, and he ends up having to eat the food of the very animals he's hired to feed. And one of the most amazing lines of Scripture is found in this parable in Luke when it says, and he came to his senses. Can you imagine? He's, he's sitting at that farm, and he goes, well, I came all this way to work at another farm, and look at me. My dad's servants have it better off than what I have right now. This was a mistake. I should have stayed with my dad. I should have been more about the family farm than my way. My dad's a man of reason. I bet if I go back, I was a good worker. I bet if I go back, dad take me back to work. And now we get into the graciousness part of the story. Because dad isn't working on the back 40 in his big green tractor. Dad's continually look for his son. Because the way Jesus tells the story, he says, while the son was afar off, still afar off, he saw him and he runs to him. Listen, and he doesn't just say, I got a job for you. What he says is, my son who was once dead is now alive. Bring a robe, bring the ring, bring sandals. So he was fully restored, listen, not as a servant, but as an heir again. He was an heir again. Now, I've learned this story all my life about the graciousness of God, and, and yet for the longest time it escaped me that Jesus framed this graciousness in a money context. That the young man's heart was after something else. His heart was in a different place. And since his heart was in a different place, his heart had to come back to the Father's place. Listen, the heart of money is the first foundational principle of winning at money. It always will begin with our heart. Money makes a lousy Lord, but it is a great tool. But God makes a lousy tool. He is a great Lord. So when we get the heart of money in the right place, then it lends itself to where our hands go, okay? The mechanics of money. There's mechanics of money. When we get our hearts right, then Scripture talks about the mechanics of money. Now, when we did marriage, I said that marriage wasn't complicated, that marriage actually was simple. It just wasn't easy. It's the same thing about money. It's the same thing about the mechanics of money. It's not complicated. It's rather simple. It's just not easy. Here are the mechanics of money. Give, save, spend. Those are the mechanics of money and the mechanics of money the Scripture teaches. Now, some of you right now might feel like the farmer who went to hear a sermon from John Wesley, founder of Methodism. Wesley was preaching about money, and he soon had the farmer's attention because his first point was, get all you can. The farmer liked that line. Nudge his neighbor said, this is unusual preaching. I've never heard the likes of this before. This is good. Wesley talked about hard work and purposeful living, and his second main point was, save all you can. The farmer was even more excited. Did you ever hear anything like this, he exclaimed? Wesley denounced waste and extravagance. And the farmer was quite happy thinking, I do all of this stuff. But then Wesley advanced to his third point, which was, give all you can. And the farmer said, he has gone and messed up that whole sermon. That was a courtesy laugh. But to win with money, with, to win with money, our heart's got to be in the right place, and we got to get the mechanics right. Okay? And it starts with giving. Now, to be more specific, to the Christ follower, giving is always first defined as tithing. Tithing is, isn't a generic practice. It is a specific priority. It's first. And it's a specific percentage. It's 10%. Now, tithing was introduced before the Mosaic Law. It was a part of the Mosaic Law. And it, was, it stayed in the New Testament as well. L listen to this teaching on Jesus, Matthew 23, 23. Jesus, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. 
you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. The tithe in the Old Testament, more was akin to as multiple tithes. It added up to well over 23%. I mean, when you're going to your spice rack, right, I mean, that, that's, that's some, serious, some serious tithing. And he says, you guys will go to that kind of detail to fulfill that law, but you have neglected the more importance of the matter, of, the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And then he said, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So it's interesting. He wasn't saying this is an either or. He was saying it was a both and he was saying, we need to elevate our heart over justice and mercy and faithfulness because Jesus always elevated everything. Jesus never dumbed anything down. He elevates everything. But he elevates that, but he, but he doesn't touch the tithe other than say that you should have done the former without neglecting the latter. Listen, I understand when Jesus came that he fulfills the law. And I understand that circumcision in the Old Testament which was a symbol of the covenant with God, wasn't necessary then after that with Christ. I understand that the death of Jesus Christ eliminates all need for any other sacrifice that we would ever make because Jesus sacrificed for all, all right? And then I also know that even when we look through the dietary restrictions of the Old Testament in a, in a way that which kept them clean before the Lord, they're, they're not necessary anymore. How do I know this? Because Paul addresses all of these things in all of his writings as stuff that God had already fulfilled through Christ. And he had perfect opportunity to stand up and talk about giving as well. You with me? But he elevates everything because it wasn't, it wasn't going to be any longer about a percentage. It was going to be about our heart. You know, he famously says in the Old Testament, it says, you know, don't commit adultery. And Jesus says, that's, that's not really the heart of it. He says, the heart of it is don't look at anyone lustfully. There's more to this than that. So, so he, he even comes across this rich young ruler he's called in Scripture. And, and, and the rich young ruler says, hey, I'll, how do I inherit the kingdom of heaven? He said, oh, okay, I got this. Just two things. Really? Yeah. Well, keep the, keep the law of Moses. Man, I've done that since I was a kid. What else? Just one more thing? I'm all over it, right? I mean, if you kept all the law, you were into lists, right? You, you, you could check off a list. So you give me one more thing. I'm all over it. What's the one more thing? Well, go sell everything you have and come follow me. Okay, that's a big thing. So was Jesus all of a sudden in need of all the stuff this guy had? Or was there a major heart block that had to be removed from this guy in order? And that's what Jesus was addressing. Listen, Scripture doesn't promote poverty, and it doesn't promote wealth. What it pr promotes is stewardship. Stewardship. Stewardship is I manage what someone else has. You, you've heard the old, what's better than owning your own boat? Having a friend who owns a boat, right? Yeah, it's showing you the beauty that ownership comes with a lot of responsibilities. Stewardship comes with following the owner's instruction, right? So, so stewardship is what Scripture teaches. How do we handle mechanics? How do we handle that which God has given to us? Now, it is, it is a difficult thing. You're, most of you are going to, well, Monday you might have off, but you're going to go to work, and you're going to put in your hours, or you're going to create, or you're going to do this. And I'm telling you, the biggest hurdle Americans specifically have with this thing is, listen, I work for my money. No one gives me anything. I work for it. And that's the biggest hurdle in giving in the American church is this not understanding that all we have and every opportunity we ever have is a gift from God. And that I'm placed here and I'm a steward. Because once my heart gets right and I understand stewardship, then as God directs me, I can handle what he's given me. And in fact, God, when, listen, when God sees that and he knows he can trust us, it's amazing what takes place in our life Financially, listen, God has to have our heart. That act of worship of tithing does a few things. One, it's an Old Testament principle that it redeems the rest. It's amazing in my life where Gene and I have pushed pause on tithing because we thought we were broke and how little money we had. And when we pushed play, even when we were broke on tithing, how much further everything else went. Look, that's not 
a surprise. That, that's what Scripture ends up teaching, and then God delivers on His Word. When we tithe, it demonstrates God can trust us. And if He can trust us with a little bit, He can trust us with a lot. And, and giving also, tithing frees up our heart to trust God for our provision. Now, generally, people get defensive when the pastor preach on tithing. And it's because tithing, um, tithing is so much different than tipping. But you think about it. We tip people based on the service we receive, the financial position we're in, and in my case, whether I'm in a good mood or not. We're all probably that same way, right? That's how we tip. We got, my dad was the funniest. My, my dad didn't, never understood tipping. Never. A dollar. A dollar was a great tip for my dad. Two, if he was in exceptionally good mood which was every other Thursday in odd even months or what, right? So I would, Gene and I later in life, we would have to hang back at the table after dad paid for the meal so he would kind of get out of earshot so we could actually tip the server so they can go and, and live, right? So if tipping is about me, tithing is about God. It's not about how he's serving, how is he doing. And that's why... Again, we can talk about money, but when we talk about my money, it gets a little more difficult. But I want you to understand that God doesn't, he's never been after your money. Never. It's always after our hearts. We get our heart right, the hands follow that. That's the give part. Here, so the foundational principle of winning at money is giving is the gatekeeper to winning at money. Giving is the gatekeeper. Here's the second piece, saving. That's the next mechanical practice in winning at money is saving. Now, I got a personal confession. Most of my life, especially married life, Gene and I, giving has not been a huge challenge for us. My mom demonstrated it. Even my dad, who wasn't a believer, when, when, when mom would give on the business and we'd have a good month or something, and dad would say, that's because you gave, right, Marion? And my mom said, yep. He said, okay. So dad, dad, he never stood in the way of giving tithing or giving. It's, a, it's an amazing thing about because because my dad had two kinds of money. He had pocket money and he had wallet money. Anybody's dad like this? So pocket money, I'll give you pocket money. I got keeps 20s. But the, the wallet money had $100 bills in it. And nobody got into the wallet money. You could just get into the pocket money. And he still understood this concept. So giving no problem. Saving I'm really not great at it now. We used to be horrible at it, and especially when Gene and I were first married. It seemed like we never could stay out of credit card debt. Now, we're both pretty kind of tight, you know, tight people. So, um, you know, we just, you know, that's kind of how we act all our life. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you know, if you know us, that's why you're laughing. Um, so credit card, you know, the credit card debt right now in America, cum cumulative, a trillion dollars. Trillion. We were a thousand. Seems small. But when you have $1,000 on a credit card and every single month it stays that way, no matter what you seem to do about it, it stays at $1,000, and you have no savings, that's a problem. It's called stress. Still, one of the number one causes of divorce, and definitely, I would say, fights in marriage, money. But is it a fight about money? Nah, it's not a fight about money. It's a fight about stress. No margin. And where there's no margin, there's no peace. No margin, no peace. We, we took, it was called Crown Ministries back then. It was a precursor, not a precursor as it led into Financial Peace University, but it was a financial class that Gene and I took at, at our church in Atlanta when we were on staff. And one of the first things it taught us was to save that first $1,000. Well, that might as well have been, you know, a million dollars to us, right? And then the way, the way Dave Ramsey says, he says, um, if you haven't used something in your house in the last three months, sell it. You know, you need to sell so much stuff that your kids think they're next. That's his, that's his line, right? Because here, here's the correlation I made. So, so my mom used to have this phrase. She said, a problem isn't a problem if money can solve it. And I went, okay, that's fine. That just seems to me multiply my problems, <laughs> right? Because I still had no money for them problems. But my mom was, it, it made a lot of sense. That it's amazing. When you had some money saved for emergencies, it was amazing what wasn't a problem anymore. you got to get your car serviced. shouldn't be a problem. 
I, I got a crown coming up. I mean, I'm sorry if there's any dentists in the room. It seems like the most expensive place I walk in the planet, right? And, and it's like, if I would have known it would have cost me this much money, I would have taken better care of my teeth when I was younger. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I don't want to spend money in my mouth, right? But a crown, I mean, I go, in, I go into the dentist office saying, I'm a cash paying customer. Don't just order those x-rays. I, need, I mean, I'm a terrible customer, okay? And, and, uh, but, you know, when, you, when, when you've got money saved, then a crown's not a problem. It's not an emergency. Debt and savings are polar opposites of one another. Debt is the enemy to margin. Listen, Proverbs 6, 6 through 8 says this. One of my favorite passages. Love the language in this passage. You'll learn to love it. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Isn't that a great word? Find that in Scripture? Sluggard? Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It's no commander, no overseer, or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. God has even embedded saving into the DNA of ants. And I still have trouble with it. Debt works against savings. Saving creates margin. Debt eliminates margin. Savings increase peace. Debt increases stress. Again, simple principle. Not easy. It's a discipline. If you win it, want, want to win it money, you've got to have a discipline. You know the hardest person to say no to is? You. You are the hardest person to say no to. I remember, because you can finance anything. You know that, right? You can finance anything. So I thought I wanted to start riding bikes. Well, one. I didn't need to ride two. So I want to ride a bike. And uh, so I rode my dad, again, my dad a bike. And so I'd go get dad's bike. And, and I would ride some nights after work. And I started feeling better. And I said, well, you know what? I actually, dad's bike's not good enough for me. I actually need another bike. Now, if you know my wife, you know this was a one-sided conversation. She was not having this conversation with me. So I decided I was going to go to a bike store to buy a real bike, right? Where you dress up and wear the, you know. So I'm, I'm going there. And yeah, okay. Sorry to put that image in everyone's mind, right? So... So I, go, so I go to this bike store, and I'm looking. I had no idea how much these bikes were. It's crazy. It's like more than my first truck, right? And so I'm looking at one, and the salesman comes, and I should have known I was in the wrong place to begin with, right? When you're in a bike store and there's a salesman, I should have known there was a problem. And uh, the bike was 600 bucks, just entry-level Trek bike, 600 bucks. He said, you interested in that bike? I said, I like that bike. He said, do you like to buy that bike? I said, no, nah, I don't have $600. He said, I can finance that for you. And that was my come to my senses moment. I went, dude, listen, if I got to finance this bike, I will never ride this bike, right? If I don't have enough discipline to save the $600 to buy the bike, I will not have enough discipline to ride this bike, all right? So I, I bought the $40 helmet I left, and I kept riding my dad's bike. And about a month later, I stopped riding, right? So the toughest person to say no to is you. That's the discipline money. Here, foundation principle number three. Uh, our found, for number four is, um, where am I lost? Did I get lost? No, three, saving builds margin, margin increases peace, and having peace equals winning money. Would you agree that having peace around money, that's a win, right? All right. Here's the last one on, on spending. Remember, money is a tool. Money is a tool. It's a mechanical piece of winning. You have bills to pay. You got food to purchase. You got kids to put in school. I mean, it, th these are all normal things, all things that have to get done. And here becomes the last piece, mechanical money. Now, you've got to spend it. Now, here's what I have found. A budget is the best way to stay on point in your spending. How many math nerds in the place? Math nerds. You, you are a math nerd. You like spreadsheet. Almost the same percentage in our first service. Negligibly, none of you, right? Right? And so, and so only math nerds enjoy budgets. You know, they want to get the other spouse around because they're excited about how they've made the numbers work, you know, and they're real excited about that, right? And, and then the, the spouse that's not the math nerd is like, huh? You know, and like there's no interest in it, but I'm telling you what a budget does is a budget takes all the emotion out of spending. It gives you this 10,000-foot view you get to look down at everything, and you get to make the budget direct you to your co-developed plan and path with God. No budget is more like letting your spending and your desires and your wants drive your life 
And what you find is it doesn't take you to where you want to end up. You know, Financial Peace University is a great tool that teaches bud budgeting. But budget, I have found, is an important discipline. And without that discipline, it's easy to get off track. That's the fourth principle. Winning at money is a matter of discipline. Matter of discipline. Now let me end with the power of money. Does, the money, does money have power? Well, it does. We give it power. If it finds the right heart and the right hands, then amazing things get done with money. Listen to this passage of Scripture in Acts 20, 42 through 47. I've used this passage, but not in this context before. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying favor of all the people. And listen, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's crazy. What was going on? Pentecost, the Holy Spirit had come at the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people give their life to Christ. Now, this whole community starts to change. And now this group of people are together, and they're paying more attention to the, they want, they want to hear what the apostles are teaching about Jesus. And then they're like, oh, wait a minute. There's a bunch of people over here that have some extreme needs. And I've got this corner piece of property that I was going to sell to Eckerd. But there, I don't. I don't, I don't need to sell that to Eckerd. I'll just, I'll, I'll sell it. I'll, and hey, look, Apollo, here, here's some stuff for everybody. Well, it was the drastic change how everybody was seeing everything that caused people to see this new community and say, wow, there's something to what you guys have. And, and giving was a component of that. That they saw giving, how it, people changed around that. It was impactful to them. It had, it had some power. Here's something Jesus taught in Luke chapter 6. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap, which means it has exceeded your cup if it's getting into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now that verse of Scripture has been used out of context so often, it just kind of makes me sick. So many times that passage of Scripture is used as if God is our tool. Ah, so here's how this works. So I give, and then I get this. Okay, well, I can do the math, so I'm going to give because I want this. Now, that, do you understand how that is? God's a tool. God's not a Lord. But we understand that as God is Lord, is really God? That if you have my heart, you keep giving more, so more is for me, right? I mean, it is, right? I mean, I get my paycheck twice a week. It's given for me. That's how I pay my bills. But when I give, and when I tithe, when I give first, and when I give, it's amazing what gets left for everyone else God puts in my life to give. And then, let me just look at this here. I'm going to show you a couple pictures. It builds the kingdom of God. This first picture, this is the Takam Church in the Takam Village right outside Siem Reap, Cambodia, that six years ago I stood on this platform and said, after I got back from Cambodia, we had just gotten into this building, and I said, Buddhism is the majority religion in Cambodia, like 98%, less than 2% in this country, and here we have an opportunity to buy a piece of property and to establish a church where, one, the average age was 14, and you can see all these kids there, and... Um, this church, together, we bought this piece of property. And then with other churches, we combine. The building gets built. They're building an academic village around this now. I mean, they had a library. This is, this is crazy. How does this happen? Kingdom people doing kingdom God stuff with God's put in his hand. Here's, a, here's another picture. This is outside of um, Kenya uh, or a place in Kenya, Kasumu. Um, you see it has our scripture on it. Um, I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Go to the next picture. Well, first of all, flip back. I'm sorry, Shelly. You see those yellow containers? They're for water because not only...
did this church join with other churches to build, now flash, to build this chapel, this open air chapel. Next picture. But we also paid and had a well dug that people come every single day for that water, every single day. And then one of the ways that's used that water is to baptize people. How, how does that happen? That happens when God's people, when God's people get the heart and the mechanics and the power. We can dig with a spoon, we can dig with a shovel, or we can dig with a front end loader. You know, the more people that dig in the kingdom, the bigger the holes get made. And this next picture, this is not a picture of a, of a place. It's a picture of Ramon and Elba. Um, and these are, our, these are our pastors in Uruguay. We've been partners with them for a long time. You see those smiles? That's why we keep going back to Uruguay. The way they love on our people every time we go, and, and we're, we're in partnership with them in our church, and, and, and they're going to embark on um, building a new place in the coming years. And I hope uh, that we can be just as significant of a part of that as we have been in Cambodia and how we've been in Kenya. We've supported church plants in Tampa, Florida, um, Nashville, Spring Hill, Madison, Alabama. I mean, this is about building the kingdom, folks. And I had a friend who used to say that salvation is free, but ministry is expensive. And when, when, when God's people get the heart and the mechanics, it's amazing what gets done. Let's show the next picture. This is one of the things that's gotten done. You know, when we bought the property in 2009, we had to give the owners a 30-day extension to get the cows off. It's been a, this had been a piece of property. It had been a farm. Pastor, why are you showing us buildings and stuff? I know there are a lot of Christians get, get fed up around buildings. I had a church planner come to me. He's, and the hardest move of church planning, come on, Chris. The hardest move in church planning, first hardest move in church planning, is getting enough people initially that want to start a church. <laughs> Makes sense, right? The next hardest path of a church plant is to get permanent. Okay? So this young church planner, church is one, church is two years old. He came to me and felt this big stir that it was time. They have to start thinking about how they're going to be permanent. And he said, but I'm torn, Pastor. I'm torn over because, you know, facilities and stuff, they cost so much money. I'm torn. And I called him by name. I said, did you come here to plant a temporary church or a permanent church? Because at some point, the movie theater is going to kick you out. He said, well, I came here to be a permanent church. I said, then you're going to have to move past you're going to have to move past this block you have. Remember I told you last week, I said, at your workplace, when you work, treat your work as worship, you become a cathedral in that place. And you light the place up. Well, what do you think these other things do? Think about how many people that have come through Gateway. Think about, and we can't even think about how many people are coming through Tacom or Kenya, Uruguay. Money, m- money is a tool that when we get our lives in line with God's plan, the things he does with even the littlest that we give, that, that, that's really the amazing part. It's, it's never been about an amount with God. It's always been about heart with God. That's why he makes a comment on the one older woman in the temple dropping in her two copper coins and watching some of the other people drop in large bags of money. His attention wasn't to, look how generous His attention is, look at the heart. The smallest of gifts given with the heart of God, you never never can limit the trajectory of what that happens. Some people say, I don't have, you know, I'm just telling you. This is that, why, why, why am I, you know, why am I talking? Listen, I know you think, well, you, got, you sent me a letter, Pastor, and you sent me an email about finishing strong. This must be what this message is about. Honestly, this message has been on the book since January. Hashtag winning was in my idea book in 2018 on trying to tackle these relationships that can drive us or we can really get a handle on them. And it started as a scribbled down idea in 2018 in my journal. Gets in, turned into a message outline in December and then dropped in a calendar in 2019 and it hits now. Simple as that. Not only does God not want our money and wants our hearts, I don't want your money either. 
And those of you who know me know that to be true. So if you don't know me and this is, well, I can't believe I've come to church today and hit another message around money. I, I hope to teach on it for a lot, actually, because I think it's that important to how we live our life. But if you think that's what I'm after, you don't know me and you don't know the heart and body of our church. So let me just add that disclaimer. Last week when I preached on work, the way I ended it was I said, um, if you're having trouble at work, or you're out of work, um, or you're having trouble connecting the dots between worship work, and I asked people to stand. And people stood up all over in both service, and we prayed for you at work. I had a conversation with a teacher right after our first service, and she said, Pastor, um, it looked like I wasn't going to uh, have a job at that school um, you know, I moved here mid-semester from another place and just didn't look like it was going to work out, you know. And, and my principal came to me this week, this week, and said, we really want to hold on to you. I'm going to do everything I can to keep you. So here now is the question. Are you struggling with money? Whether how you handle money or there's not anything there to handle. Would you be willing to stand for prayer now? Well, Pastor, this one is way more personal than the work one. I understand. I'm just going to tell you how it works in my life. When it works in my life, when I'm ready to surrender to God, things happen. And as long as I want to keep grips of it, He lets me just have my own way with it. I'm not trying to embarrass you in any stretch of imagination. What I am want to do is I want to pray for you. You have trouble handling money or you're in a need right now. I want, to st- I want you to stand so we can pray. Anybody bold enough to do that? Pastor, I have a hard time handling money and I find myself in a place of need. Anybody going to stand? Amen. You know, when Gene and I, we were at a conference in Dallas shortly after Gateway launched. And the pastor, the pastor stood and said, I know we got a bunch of church planters in here, and I know that money's tough planting a church. But if you're willing to come forward to pray, I want to pray over you for God's provision. It didn't take Gene and I long to get our butts out of that seat and get us down to that altar. And that's what you've done. And Father, you see, Lord, those standing here today. Lord, no doubt, Lord, have already settled a number of issues just by standing. And so, Father, one, I pray for provision in their life. Lord, that's what your promise is. When we trust you, there is provision, and they've trusted you in this moment to stand. Lord, I pray already, Lord, to begin opening the doors of provision. And Father, I pray that your words would find deep lodging place on how to handle money. They wouldn't have stood without the heart already, the heart they're getting aligned. So now, Lord, I pray for the hands. Lord, the disciplines necessary to win in this element of their life. And Lord, I pray for margin, that you would begin creating margin in their life to reduce the stress in the name of Jesus we pray now if everyone stand I've discovered that isolation is one of the enemy's most effective tools at defeating me isolation Isolation comes when I just kind of pull myself aside either because I'm embarrassed or whatever and I kind of and I kind of pull back and, and that's one of the one of the weapons that he uses on all of us is, is isolating us. This summer uh, in July we're offering a course uh, Financial Peace University. Financial Peace University I was told this morning because I got 
uh, undershot the number a little bit. Nearly 5 million people across the globe have taken Financial Peace University. 5 million. And we'll have this taught in July, but to very, very capable, long-term teachers of Financial Peace University. And I want to invite you. They're going to be out in the hall. You can sign up if you want or do it online, but I invite you to take Financial Peace University. It is a great tool to help us help you navigate this area of your life. We also have other people that's come forward through the years and says, you know, you've had people having trouble with getting jobs or um, managing their finances and they want to do it more one-on-one. I got a whole host of people that have told me, Pastor, you just hook me up with them and we'll get with them and we'll help them navigate this area of their life. And I want you, that is the beauty of a local church. And I'll make sure you know that. If you're a guest today, thank you for being a part of our worship service. It's been great having you. Um, Again, we have a gift for you right outside those double doors uh, under the big C. Now for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May make his face to shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. And you're rising up and you're laying down, going out and coming in both now and forevermore. God bless you. Enjoy your Memorial Day weekend.